before we get into the fifth chapter of uh, Roman <laughs> Revelation, yeah, that was close. Before we get into the fifth chapter of Revelation, I want to talk a little bit. We're going to see a Christ, by the way, in the fifth chapter of Revelation that uh, we have no experience with. We have knowledge from the scripture, but we have no experience with the person we're going to see. Uh, we're, so we're going to uh, begin tonight's uh, study by looking at the Christ we know. And I'm going to read in, excuse me, <coughs> I'm going to read in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot. Boy, John, maybe I need those Kleenexes. <laughs> no, thank you. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressions, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Uh, what a beautiful picture of Christ here in the Old Testament. Of course, in the New Testament, we have, uh, you know, the record of, of uh, him dying on the cross for our sins. Romans, in the fifth chapter and other places, that just uh, tells us a little bit about his work, his death. His death was for to redeem sinners, give people like us a chance to uh, receive eternal life. Romans 5, 8 uh, tells us a little bit about God's love and Christ's work. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the Christ we know. That's the Christ we've experienced if we've confessed our sins and cast ourselves upon his mercy. I want to read a little bit here uh, out of Luke. I was sitting there in church this morning listening to Dan's message, and I was surprised because we were up in uh, going through the book of Luke. We were up in chapter 7, but uh, Dan started off in chapter 4. And he started off in chapter 4 at... Uh, at the very verses that I was going to read tonight. Uh, let's read chapter 4. We'll start uh, with uh, 16. He, Christ, went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. I, I want to do a note. He, uh, he found the place where it is written. Christ, he, he didn't just open the scroll and, and read from any place. God had a plan. Christ had a plan. And it was to proclaim something. And here is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But this is where we're at today. This is the year of the Lord's favor. That period of time where mankind... Uh, can come to Christ in faith and receive forgiveness, the great gift of eternal life. And we can be assured that we're going to be with Christ forever, in eternity, for all time. The acceptable year of the Lord. Now I want to look real quickly to Isaiah. Uh, 61. We will get into uh, Revelation here soon. Isaiah 61. I want to read the first two verses. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. Here's where Christ was reading. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's where Christ stopped quoting. But it goes on. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. That's the part that Christ left out. Why? Because uh, we live in this beautiful time uh, of the Lord's favor. By grace, we're saved through faith. Uh, it's a beautiful, it's a wonderful time. We we don't really realize all the treasures that we have living in this age, where we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Um, the, God has just showered us with blessings. There is a time coming, and we're just getting into it in the book of Revelation, where it, we're going to be reading about uh, the day of vengeance of our God. Well, let's look at uh, Revelation, fifth chapter. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides 
and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb standing as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. There's a seal. There are seven seals on this scroll. This scroll, as we're going to see later, is judgment, the beginning of judgment against an earth, against an earth that has rejected Christ. Now, there's a problem. John looks around. He cannot find anybody. No one can be found that has the right to open that. No one has the right to bring this kind of judgment on the earth. He looks. He doesn't see anybody. But the angel tells him, hey, the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is a, one of Christ's titles, he is conquered. And he is worthy to open this these seals. He's the only one that's worthy. Now, I wanted to look uh, real quick at a different picture of Christ. The only being on heaven or earth or under the earth who is able, who is worthy to uh, open these and begin judgment upon the earth. Let's look at Isaiah 63, different picture of Christ. Who is this coming from Edom, from Basra, with his garments stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are your garments red, like those of one treading the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone from the nations. No one was with me. I trampled them in my anger. I trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments, and I stained all my clothing, for the day of vengeance was in my heart. And the year of my redemption 
has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm worked salvation for me. My own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath, I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. I'm kind of very happy and pleased that I live in the time of the Lord's favor. <laughs> I'm very pleased that God has given us all the opportunity to escape this time of vengeance. We're living in this time of grace. It's a wonderful thing. And uh, I would just say that uh, today, if we hear his voice, if, if we don't know Christ, if we hear his voice uh, urging us to turn from our sinful ways, to, uh, to come to him and accept his free gift of salvation, I just urge us all not to harden our hearts, but to respond to this love uh, by coming to him and seeking his salvation. Uh, because what is coming next for those that reject Christ is horrible. We're going to be reading things. Uh, by the time these, by the time Christ gets done opening all these seals and the, and the vials and the trumpets, uh, the population of the earth will be diminished by billions in a period of seven years. This is no place you want to be. Now, we read, and we're going to see it in a couple of places here in Revelation as we go, Christ, Christ would unleash a horrible judgment upon the earth, and he would say, and still they did not repent. So we see that the intent of this judgment, even then, even during this period of time, is to cause people to uh, kind of assess the situation and say, wait a minute, I've blown it. And cause people to repent and come to him. And many do, by the way, and because they do, many are martyred. We're going to read that as we proceed through this book. Uh, so uh, we've got a Christ. All, all we think of Christ now is, uh, you know, it's a wonderful time. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever Believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life, have everlasting life. What a wonderful time. This same Christ, and by the way, in Revelations there, we saw that he did it alone. Why? Because he's the only one worthy to open this, to open this, these seals, to begin this judgment on the earth. And in, in uh, the passage we read there in Isaiah, Christ speaks about, he, I, I did it alone. There was no one else. There was no one else to support me. Why? Because all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Uh, we are not worthy or nor fit to bring judgment on anyone. Only the perfect Lamb of God who was sacrificed for the earth, for the people of earth, uh, he did everything he possibly could to bring these people that reject him into his family. And he is the one that has the right then to say, okay, you don't want me, it's over. Uh, there's a verse in Psalms, well, Psalm 2, that talks about, you know, if it would be wonderful if we would all respond to God's love for us in a positive way. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But Psalms, the second Psalm talks about 
uh, just a lo looking at facts, how powerful he is. He's coming to judge the world. In, in, in Psalm 2, it says, kiss the sun. <laughs> I mean, be, make a rational decision here. Judgment is coming. A horrible judgment is coming. He's going to trample the nations like, like, a, like a man in a trampling in the wine press. His garments are going to be splattered with blood, it says. Now, he's doing this, as we're going to see in Revelation, from, uh, from, this, from, the, from heaven. He is his servants, the angels, are going out in, into the earth and carrying out his uh, commands. So, worthy is the lamb. He's the only one worthy to bring this kind of judgment on the earth. Uh, there's an interesting thing here. When he begins, oh, by the way, when we see, when right today, the scripture says that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. He makes intercession for us. Uh, in Revelation 5, we see a lamb as, as though it had been slain, but he is standing, and he strides forth in power and glory to take uh, this book and to, by opening it, pour out these horrible judgments on the earth. So we see him uh, in a much different light than we have ever experienced him. Okay. One other thing I wanted to note here before we begin our discussion. Uh, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. What kind of prayers do you think those are? These are prayers of the saints. I, it doesn't tell us here in... Uh, Reading uh, some other guys, some commentators, I come across a guy that I think had a really great point at this place. He said, uh, these are the prayers of the saints from all ages. Who were suffering, downtrodden, martyred, Lord, Lord, make it right. I want to see justice prevail. You know, right from uh, Adam and Eve as they knelt by their son, Abel. Oh, so messed up, Lord. Bring on the day where all is, all is righteous, all is good. Uh, doesn't say that anywhere that those are what those prayers are, but I, I think that's what they are. Christ stands to open, to bring judgment upon the earth, and in the, and the prayers of the saints are ascending as He's doing this. Well. Have some discussion on this chapter. What do you think? Comments? I like how the lamb is standing in the center of the throne. Mm -hmm. You couldn't possibly get the center of the throne of God. Mm -hmm. one. Only one. <laughs>
and we see the Trinity here uh, because he takes this book from the hand of the one seated, sit, seated in the uh, throne in the middle of the throne room. Questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, it means basically that, that Christ is aware. It says here that in seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. It's, it's telling us that he is aware of everything that's going on everywhere on this planet. And everywhere, not just this planet. Full awareness. He has seven horns. He's all-powerful. He's the only one in heaven and earth who can open these seals. Any other comments? You know, uh, the 24 elders here, uh, we don't know exactly who they are. Some people uh, believe they're angel, powerful angels that uh, we are, you know, we're not aware of. Others think that it's uh, uh, redeemed men because they're wearing white. We don't, I don't know that we read that in this, but the chapter 4, uh, white raiment, raiment is uh, indicative of the righteous acts of the saints because of the righteousness which God has imputed to us. And so uh, many people believe that they are uh, redeemed men. But we don't, I don't know that anybody knows that for sure. When we get there, we'll know. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a talk that John, it was on Island of Silence. And he must have been pretty old by the by time of watching John Cook's vision. And then he wrote it, he wrote it down. Uh, and then were there other people with him that helped him? I don't know just how it happened. I doubt that they had a, a group copying, making copies there on the island. I think uh, he probably, uh, it sounds like, uh, I mean, people could go there, they could visit him. Um, and he wrote a letter which John carried back to the churches. And I'm sure everybody went scrambling to get make copies. <laughs> He did this one. So that was Revelation led to a letter then. Yep. Okay, I never thought of it that way. So it's uh, the book of Revelation is a letter, like a very complex, long one. And if he sent it, sent it to the, the church in the beginning, 
Mhm. And then then they went and made copies. Mhm. Uh and that's how it got around to us. Mhm. I was just wondering, I've always been fascinated by that part of it. Um because we were down in Wilmington Town and then we came up to we saw this incredible vision. Mhm. Well, he was told to write it down. Yeah. Comments? Questions? Thing? Yeah. Sang a new song. Well, yep. Uh, well, you are worthy to take the scroll open its seals because you were slain with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation see that song would not have been written before the uh, crucifixion they might even call it maybe a new covenant yeah. or perhaps a new testament yeah <laughs> you would be very disappointed if they did. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.